Blake team, um, production team, we're about to get started. A very good afternoon to you all and welcome to the Oli Consulting Monthly PM Roundtable. My name is Ade Adeyemi. I'm, the, I'm your host. Um, for those joining us for the first time, Oli Consulting is a management consulting firm. We specialize in IT professional services in the areas of staffing, training, and project delivery services. Essentially, what we do is connect IT professionals through opportunities within the industry. We also provide training and employment placement services for individuals that are looking to get into the fields of project management and business analysis. Our mandate for the PM Roundtable is to create an avenue where uh, our IT professional community can share information, network, discuss best practices, uh, industry, industry trends, and present opportunity for growth. Essentially, our goal is to raise leaders. And we certainly hope that today's roundtable will further that agenda. Our topic for today is around navigating your career for success. Now, we do have some exciting panelists, our guest panelists, uh, experts, industry experts, that will be sharing some thoughts, uh, some uh, very, very in, important nuggets around how to navigate your career for success. Uh, before we get into the conversation, we'll start with some introduction. Uh, so, uh, so without further ado, we'll start with our first introduction of our first panelist, Nada Bohendi. Welcome, man. Welcome, Nada. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to meet everyone. Um, thank you for making time on the Saturday. Hopefully we're going to have a lot of fun in the session. It's not just going to be learning, but my goal is to always for people to have fun. Um, so just a little bit about me. You can check out my um, story and my website at nadabohendi.com. But you'll see that um, I was a disaster before coming, becoming a master, where I actually quit over text because I was so burnt out in my career. And the thought for me was that I had to either be a starving, poor artist to be happy in my career, or I had to be a miserable six-figure you know, professional. So fortunately, I got my wake-up call after meeting my career coach, Kara Heilman, and ironically decided to become you know, a career coach where I've successfully helped over 100 you know, people um, land you know, jobs that they love in the six-figure salary range. 50% of them are immigrants because I'm also an immigrant and I have a deep passion around empowering people. And yeah, this is it. I just want to have fun with all of you. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn later on and ask me any question that's uh, at the top of your mind. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Nada. Uh, I've also read your story and I'm really inspired by it. And I'm sure that uh, our audience will uh, benefit a great deal and uh, uh, feel the same way. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next panelist that we'll be introducing uh, is Chris Daly. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Ade. And uh, I'm also very grateful to be here and to be sharing with you this afternoon. Um, with a weather like ours, when we have two weeks of sunshine, I do recognize the sacrifice. And so I'm happy that you're here. Um, I see Nada agrees. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I'm an accountant, uh, currently working in the performance and financial analysis space. Uh, and in this role, I do budgeting, planning and forecasting, providing aggregated uh, financials to senior management and leadership, as well as providing detailed data to uh, the units and business uh, leaders. I can also share that uh, although accounting has been my mainstay, I've had to navigate my career uh, being an immigrant twice. So having to redirect, refocus and um, build uh, my career, having migrated twice. So I do come from that unique perspective of having to reset and restart. And I hope to share my experience with you so that the tidbits of my uh, journey can help and inform yours. Happy to be here. Over to you, Ade. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, and I'm excited because I, um, uh, I've had the opportunity, uh, the privilege uh, to have the one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, both Nada and Chris, and I'm really fired up. I'm excited with uh, the conversation we're going to be having today. And, and the conversation is going to be, we're going to talk about different things. We're going to talk about so many things here today. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, we'll talk about how we can evolve your career in today's job market? How can you navigate? How can you achieve success uh, in today's job market? Um, there's so much to unpack here today, guys. I'm really excited. Uh, so what we're gonna do right now, we'll, we will exit the presentation mode and just get to um, get a feel for who's on the call, uh, get to see the panelists, get to see everyone's faces and um, you know, we'll get into this conversation. Um, the first question uh, before we, you know, to get us started, we're gonna start with you first, Nada. And the first question that I have, uh, it's actually a threefold question here. Uh, what is the impact of career goal setting on, on one's overall career success? That's part one of the question. And the second part of the question is, how best can an individual set career goals? And lastly, uh, are there any hacks to career goal setting? Over to you, Nada. That is a very um, great, great question. And I actually have you know, an entire 30 minute talk that covers it um, based on a technique that I've designed called the slimy frog technique. I know it sounds a little you know, funny and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it and I'll give you some highlights. The first thing that I wanted to say um, is that Simon Sinek, you know, of course, you know, he, he talks about how you need to start with your why, but I respectfully disagree with that. I actually think that people need to start with their fears, then their why. And I'll tell you um, the reasoning behind it. You know, I've worked with over 100 people, amazing people, you know, people who are really good at what they do. But the biggest thing that blocks them is fear. They think they're not good enough. Um, there's a lot of, you know, past trauma, either from childhood or past jobs where a boss said to them that they're terrible at what they do. And that ends up blurring their vision and causing them to set goals that actually um, are not the right goals for them. And so this is why I say, you know, try to understand first, you know, what's blocking you. And then once you understand that, then you want to set goals. And when you set goals, you don't want to set goals around, yeah, I want to get this amazing resume or I want to get into company X, Y, Z. I want you to sit back and ask yourself the question of what kind of impact do I want to create, you know, in my life or, or for others? Um, what, you know, how do I want to feel? A lot of people don't ask themselves these questions and overly focus on particular goals that because everyone else, you know, is um, going after them. And that's really one of my tidbits. And I'll tell you a quick story about one of my clients who came from Nigeria and all of the recruiters were basically saying to him that the most you can ever achieve is $75,000 salary. And so that was his goal. His goal was to get a job at $75,000. Um, and when him and I worked together, I found out that he was the head of IT in Nigeria. And I'm like, oh my goodness, no, 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 no. You're, you're not gonna go for $75,000 salary. That's ridiculous. And once we peeled the fear, there was a fear around, you know, he didn't do well on a Microsoft interview. There was a fear of I'm an immigrant, so I have to start over. And once we took away all of these things and he was provided the right approach, he ended up hitting a $200,000 salary at a company where he gets excited waking up in the morning. And that's really my lesson for you all is that start with your fears, um, come up with a North Star, and then just, you know, focus on one thing at a time. And if you want to, I don't want to hijack this entire, you know, session. If you want to learn more about the Slimy Frog technique, then feel free to message me on LinkedIn and I can definitely share it with you. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Nada. That's really insightful. And, and it's interesting that you said most people talk about start with why, because your why, you know, we've had sessions, uh, we've had some past sessions where we talked about the why is extremely important. But then 
uh, what people don't focus on is the fear. And I know there was one of our panelists that talked about uh, faith and fear. Uh, you get to choose one. Uh, they, they have their feelings that are unseen. We can't see them, but we believe in them. Which one do you want to believe in? Your fears or your faith? Uh, you know, just really insightful. And I love the story you shared around the Nigerian uh, international professional that you know got that job and that's sort of what we preach because we understand that a lot of international uh professional uh on the call today uh find themselves in situations where they have to do some jobs that may not necessarily align with what they've experienced in the past thank you thank you so much and uh, we're gonna go next to chris uh chris my question for you chris is uh when what are so, what are what are the real impacts of skill acquisition or upskilling on your one's overall career growth? Interesting question. Um, being in the accounting profession, uh, there is, or when you've joined any uh, professional organization, be it PMI or so on, there's always this section of your designation that requires you to do some continuous learning. And the rationale for that is, uh, if you're doing the same thing you've done for the past two years, you're obsolete. Uh, we can all agree that uh, the only constant is change. The way you do things are changing, the terminologies that you use, the way you go about it. So if you're not upskilling, if you're not learning um, in your own field, uh, refreshing what you know, then you find that you're behind. So I really do think that upskilling is the way to keep current. Upskilling is the way to actually just maintain the level that you are. And I don't look at it as an additional burden. I just look at it as, okay, this is what I do to keep relevant in my space. And this is how I think one should look at upskilling and look at continuous learning. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's been called continuous learning. It's called upskilling. It's been called rebranding. It's, it, has a, it has gone through a lot of re-engineering of name and even the way what we call it has changed. So, it is very necessary for us to be always continuing to look uh, at what we do, how we do it, and of course, better ways to do it. And that's what upskilling is. And that is what uh, I think is relevant for you to exist and not just exist, but, but to strive in your industry. So uh, upskilling, uh, reskilling, uh, really, really important uh, in today's uh, industry, especially with the ever-changing uh, landscape, uh, especially when you look at folks in IT, there's a new technology, there's a new skill set that you need to learn to just stay up to date. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Uh, we're going to go to you next, Nada. Nada, this is sort of like a continuation of the first question. Uh, my question, this question to you is, is there any direct correlation between one's passion for the job and their career success? That's a great, great question. I love that question. I love answering it. And what I'll say is, you know, out of, I on average speak to over 500 people, one-on-one -on -one conversations of job uh, seekers. And I'm going to tell you that I haven't met a single person who doesn't want to wake up excited to go to work um, and make a well-paying, you know, salary because, you know, with inflation rates, <laughs> I mean, let's be real with the gas prices, <laughs> we're all bleeding out of our pockets. So, um, but we also want to do it in a way where we are feeling excited. And so I don't think it's that people, um, don't want to just want to do things that they don't enjoy. I think the issue is around the fear is, can I even do this? Um, and as well as um, how do I go about it? Right? How do I go about it? I don't have a method to go about it. And I think once people are empowered with the method, and this is why, you know, in my program, I basically have three pillars, define your purpose, express your purpose, and then sell your purpose. Once you nail those three things, then you're going to be able to get a job where you feel happy. But um, yeah, to answer your question, of course, I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to wake up in the morning excited? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's a, there's a very strong correlation around that. And I haven't met a single person 
in the past, I don't know, a couple of years that I've been doing this as a, as formally as a career coach um, that expressed otherwise. I'll get people sometimes who will say, can you just write my resume or can you help me with um, the interviews? And then what I do is what I, what my <laughs> mentor, Kara Heilman, who's the president of the International Association of Career Coaches, literally did to me, confronted me, confronted the elephant in the room and said, do you even enjoy what you do? And I'm like, ouch, you know, because I was trying to hide from that question because of all of the fear of, you know, giving up my six figure um, career. So, and fortunately I listened and, and I ironically doubled my salary when I did that. Wow. Well, wow. really, really, really exciting uh, and inspiring, uh, Nader. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we've come to a new age um, and a lot of people that I speak to, they talk about, uh, they care more about peace of mind than the money. Uh, they care more about time, uh, enjoying the things that you love, doing the things that you love, uh, working with the people that you love to work with, feeling like you belong in an environment uh, that you're working in. Uh, it's extremely important. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Uh, we're gonna go, again, before we go to Chris, I just wanna encourage Everyone, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Do share your questions in the chat. Uh, we will get to those questions. I just want to encourage everyone to, uh, we have these panelists, these expert panelists, they're here to share. Uh, please share your questions. Uh, we'll go next to Chris. Uh, Chris, my question for you is almost like a, a second part, part two of what Nada just answered. How best can one discover uh, one's eating potential and channel them towards career growth? Uh, what I would say to that is diversify your access to information. Uh, if you keep going to the, you know, they say one of the signs of madness is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. If you want to discover hidden potential or even look at the same thing a different way uh, is, is read. Um, now uh, we can use Audible, it could be podcasts, it could be explore areas of, of careers that you, of your career that you might not necessarily have an interest in, but it will give you a viewpoint. And so in discovering something, in, in going something new, you can't go along the same path and just hope that something new will appear. Or you cannot, uh, you would have to, you have to actively seek that out. So I would say to you, it's to... The challenge would be to innovate, you know, and you are not an in innovative. You can't, you will not be innovative if you're not challenged. And you, you, you have to see different viewpoints and different ways of actually coming at, uh, at different things. Uh, accounting and math, you know, there's two plus two, three plus one, four, you know, get you to that same answer. But if you're always going one way, then you actually don't see it. So I'd say my simple uh, retort to that would be to diversify your access of information. Diversify what you listen to. Um, listen to different points of views. It might not necessarily be that you agree with it, but you can agree with the logic of how it's formed. And that is what you need. Interesting. Well, thanks so much, Chris. And, and you know, over at this round table, we've talked about it in the past, um, access to information is key. And there are so many ways, uh, like you mentioned, rightfully mentioned, Chris, there are so many ways that you can access information, uh, podcasts. We've, we even suggest reading books, uh, audio books. You can, you know, uh, listen to those while you're on the train, uh, you're on your tube going to work. Um, I, I think, again, diversifying where you get information, who you listen to, how you, get, you know, what sort of information, what's possible, because often people find them, and then speaking to the, um, you know, the immigrants on the call, uh, international folks uh, be new in Canada, often when you're new in a country, a lot of people have different needs around what's possible and what's attainable. Um, I think speaking to the right people, you know, networking and getting information from different people does help uh, you in terms of uh, understanding what's possible and pathway forward. Thank, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we're gonna move to you next, uh, Nada. Nada, this question here, you know, a lot of people 
you know, find themselves in environments where, uh, or find themselves in a toxic environment. Are there any special hacks to thriving in a uh, thriving in a in a toxic work environment, or is there is, is it just best for one to walk away? A great question and something that um, I experienced firsthand. I mean, I mean, someone who quits over text must have been fed up, right? <laughs> By the way, I'm not saying that anyone should quit over text. I'm saying don't get to that point and, and do it, right? Um, I wasn't lucky to, to have someone to keep me from doing that or to help me um, before it got to that point. But uh, I'll say that um, maybe 30 to 40% of my clients who come to me um, usually are trying to get out of a toxic situation. And um, I'll give you an example of one of my um, recent wins. Um, I have a client who was literally in tears when she came to me because she was in a very horrible, you know, toxic situation to the point that it was causing a lot of health issues. So you got to ask yourself, right, when you are in that situation, what is it costing me by staying where I'm at? rather than, oh my God, I don't know, I'm going to quit, I'm not going to make money, etc. And especially if what's costing you is your health, well, you're going to end up being let go anyway, if, if it is a toxic situation, if it gets to the point where you're unable to perform. So you want to ask yourself, if it is getting to the point where it is, you know, detrimentally impacting your health, then you know that it is time to leave. There's no sugarcoating this, right? Because you, you want to think of your career in the long term, not just this job. If it impacts your health to the point that you may not be able to work for a long period of time or go on disability. Um, so in that situation, I definitely recommend for people to work with someone who can help them navigate how they can leave that situation, right? In a way that it's in their best interest. Um, and in that particular situation with my client, after us going through the pros and cons, and, and this is why I'm not giving you like a black and white answer, because I truly think that everyone's situation is different and everyone's tolerance for risk is different. You know, maybe some people are not, have a lot of responsibilities, et cetera, and they can't just get up and leave, right? And so we have to find other ways to make it easy for the person to um, navigate it without creating, you know, even more stress for them. So in, in that situation, you know, my client and I decided that it was actually in her best interest to leave and take a break and, and recharge. And when she did that, she actually, she was in a startup. I'm not going to say the name of the startup. Um, actually, a, a, you know, a startup that is actually well known and works with large organizations. Um, and she ended up landing a role at Microsoft. And that is because she was in the mindset and, and to answer Kenny's question, <laughs> she navigated to a product manager role. What we did was we spent time strengthening her product management knowledge. We ended up um, taking the time because now she's in the right mindset to dig through her entire career history and rebrand you know, herself to work on her confidence and communication skills. So she's not bringing over the baggage you know, from the old role to the interviews. Because the thing that people forget that interview, um, the job search process is like a relationship right? Don't think of it of, oh, resume, interview, I have to memorize these questions. No, it is a relationship. And it's like, when you go through a breakup, do you jump into a relationship? Um, and, you know, when you are going into these dates, do you start crying about your ex? You know, you don't want to do that, right? And um, when you are um, entering into a new relationship. Um, so that's really, um, it's not really a hack, but that's really my guideline um, in terms of how to navigate it is ask yourself, what is it costing me by staying where I am? And let's try to find someone who can help me through this. This is why I also have a community of people as well um, who are in the same kind of, um, uh, who have been through these things in order to create a support system for people. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Nada. And I think that's really interesting when you talk about what is it costing me and people may think, well, they think about the money because that's what's coming in. But the mental health aspect of things is extremely important because uh, I, for one, have been in a situation like that many, many years ago. Um, and I had a manager where uh, I find myself, the only thing I could talk about when I get back home was that person. And it was beginning to affect my own personal relationship. And um, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, again, it's costing us in different ways. And I find that I find really interesting when you said uh, you you need to respond to it in a way that it serves your best interest. Uh, when you want to exit, you need to exit strategically because you know sometimes all we can think about is leaving, but we need to think about how we leave and how we leave the best impression. And we understand that the other relationships that we may be building in that workplace that they may not necessarily be as toxic, or they may not be the toxic ones but how we strategically look for that next move is extremely important. Thank you so much, Nader. Uh, we're going to go to Chris, and we do have a question, a question in the chat. We're going to address that question, but we'll go to Chris, and then we'll, go, we'll get to the question in the chat. Uh, so, Chris, a uh, question for you. Uh, it's been said that our everyday activities inform how, how far we go in our career. How do you change, or what can we inject into our daily activities to inform immediate growth and then career success? Interesting question. Um, I I would say uh, be intentional. Um, I picked up on what um, Nada was saying about uh, define, express, and sell. Um, You know, I've coached it a bit differently to say you need to dream it, you need to plan it, you need to believe it and you need to try it. Uh, and also, and thereafter you repeat, because uh, sometimes we'll dream and you can live in that dream space and you don't do any of the planning, you don't quite believe it and you never get to try. Uh, some persons will, uh, you know, it's not just one of the four, you have to do the entire thing. And even when you've gone through it, you can actually stumble and you're like, oh, I've tried it and it didn't work. Um, so, I'm reminded uh, by a quote that I learned um, in high school and it stuck with me. The heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. So it means that there is some elbow grease in there. There is some perseverance that is required, but the key is that you need to be intentional. So think about what you want, uh, you know, plan out how you think it should be, believe in yourself and then try. You've got to try. And uh, being, um, being an immigrant myself, uh, you come into these spaces and I, um, I've always said, write it down. You know, whatever your thought is, whatever the dream is, write it down because that allows you to be accountable to self. If you're brave enough, share it with another person, uh, but start by documenting that for you because that is a part of the intention. And when, uh, you know, persons say about affirmations, you know, you write it, you will see, you strive for it. So it's a part of being intentional, but you can't just have the intention and don't try. So I'd say have a plan, try out the plan. And if you don't succeed, uh, try again. Super. Thank you so much, Chris. And and I say this a lot, uh, being intentional about the things that we do, the ways that we, the things we want to achieve. And, um, you know, it's really important. And, and being intentional means that you incorporate practices into your daily routine that, that aligns with the things that you're trying to achieve. Um, if I need to, you know, gain some weight, maybe I need to be intentional about working out. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, exercising more. So, you know, those are things that we can put into consideration. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Again, we do strongly recommend that uh, folks, um, you know, we thank you for joining us today. We also want you to be part of this conversation. So please, please do send your questions to the chat. We have a question from Kenny. And the question I know, I know Nada uh, sort of uh, referenced the question earlier. Uh, what, what do you say to someone coming from healthcare, uh, from an healthcare background, navigating to the PM or BA world? What are your advice or advices in achieving success? I'm, I'm not sure if you want to go, who wants to go first? Uh, Nada, you want to go? 
Sure, um, I can go first. So um, I will say that 40% of my clients um, pivot into product management. I suppose because I've been a product manager myself, you know, <laughs> that's the reason they gravitate towards me. Um, but what has helped um, a lot of my clients into that pivot, including my client Rashid, who was in Mexico and literally got found by an Amazon hiring manager and not only immigrated to Canada and got Amazon to uh, help him with that, but also landed his first ever product management role. And what has helped him is really those three pillars. Um, the first one being define your purpose. And um, you may already think that or know that you want to be a product manager, but you also want to be clear on what type of product manager you want to be. There are different types of product managers. There are product managers more on the technical side. There are product managers more on the business side. There are growth product managers. There are data product managers. So you want to be very clear and focused on what type that would be. Um, the second, you know, once you've identified that sweet spot, then you want to express your purpose. And what that means is your branding needs to align with that specific, you know, um, you know, sweet spot. It's kind of like how we build products, right? We have to be clear on who our target audience is, who our customers are. We have to be super focused on that um, in order to build a great product rather than trying to please everyone. Because when you please everyone, you end up with a vanilla product or you please no one. Um, and so that's why I tell people that you got to first identify that sweet spot and be confident about it before you start your branding. And the branding has to be strong and in alignment with um, basically your sweet spot. And by branding, I mean um, anywhere where you articulate your value, whether it's your resume or your LinkedIn profile. Um, and then the third thing that is important is um, the, the last pillar, which is selling your purpose. Um, and I have a story selling you know, framework, also known as the doctor framework. Um, you can check it out on my website. If you subscribe, it'll take you to my Scrum Alliance presentation. Um, and the, the really crux of this you know, story selling framework is that the thing that you want to remember is that people recall stories the best, right? Think Disney, right? You remember all the Disney movies because they are told in a story format. So when you share your experience in a story format, it's going to resonate with your audience better. Um, so if you go in there and if you also check out my YouTube channel, there's a lot of tips on how to create your stories. Um, but the key, the common denominator across your expression and your selling is think marketing and sales, right? You want to speak in the vocabulary of these hiring managers. That's a very big sales technique that I teach people. Um, if you don't speak in the same language or in the same vocabulary as how professionals in your world speak, then they're not going to understand your experience. So if you are trying to get into product management role and you start speaking like a business analyst or a data analyst or a developer, then they're going to see you that way. And that's actually one of the big um, pitfalls that Rashid went through before he landed his Amazon role. So hopefully um, high level information, if you want to connect with me over a virtual coffee, I can chat with you more, but hopefully that's um, answered your question a little bit. Thanks so much, uh, Nada. I'm not sure, Chris, if you want to chime in there. Uh, I know there's a lot to unpack from what Nada just shared. <laughs> Uh, just to add that, in, in terms of when you're thinking of a transition, is uh, be as clear as you'd want to be, because uh, Narda is right, um, and for, you know, faint of repeating what she said, the clearer you can be about your goals and ambitions, the better you are. I've always, uh, I, I picked up a quote a couple of years ago that when you come to what we define as the first world, you don't come to find your passion here, you come to execute on it. So given that you're an immigrant, it is key that you hone in on what you your passion is or what your belief is. And if PM is where it wants to be, don't just, uh, that's the headline. There is a lot to unpack beyond a project manager that you need to. Uh, it's like saying you want to be an accountant. You know, in what industry, in what area, uh, how do you want? And the more specific you are, 
it's the better way that you can get allies. It's the better way that you can actually uh, get mentors and, uh, and uh, develop contacts. Uh, one of the things that we often get into is that you said, okay, fine, you know, um, I can do everything. Why don't you decide for me? And that's telling someone that they know you better than you. So what I would say is that take some time if you're thinking of a transition or going through a transition and hone in on what is it that brings me to this? What is it I find attractive? Why do I want to move from where I am now to this new area? And one, and the more clear you are with those, uh, with those uh, specifics, the more you get into it, it's that time that you can actually zoom in and execute. Wow, super. Thank you so much, uh, Nada and Chris. Uh, this is exciting. We're going to take another question from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a question from Alicia. Uh, the question is, what is your advice on resignation letter? If the only reason you're leaving is due to bad management, should one mention it in the letter, or are you leaving? And, uh, or since you're leaving anyways, just make another excuse. Well, let me try to take a stab at that, and then I'll let the expert of another come after. You know, you need an opening for the show. Um, what what I would say to that is. Um, if you're leaving because of a bad experience, um, you don't necessarily need to spell that out explicitly, but you can actually give a clue that you're leaving because of this. I, I don't believe that um, HR is there or it, because you'd be doing this to an HR uh, person, like an exit interview or, an ex or a letter, uh, is there to protect the interests and the rights of the company. And we sometimes confuse that, that HR is there to protect me. No, HR is there to understand, and I don't know, uh, uh, and to protect the rights of the, the organization. Um, also with the fluidity you asked me about changing and so on in the earlier questions, you might run into the paths of others again. And so I would say you can, I'd say, I don't believe in you misrepresenting yourself and lying about why you're leaving. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that if you, you can use this example, if you go to a funeral, you don't have to say this person who lies here was a bastard. You can actually, you can actually find something a little bit more nuanced to, to say about the situation. So I would coach it a little bit more political uh, more than to lie about it because you are, it does you no good to be you know, unloading on the way out. Oh my God, that was gold. I'm I'm dying. I'm I'm still recovering from the uh, funeral analogy here. Um, yes, you you know, as someone who personally experienced a horrible, horrible you know situation um, where I was discriminated against, there was actual um, factual evidence around that and investigation and all that. And I'll tell you, you know, that 100%, you know, as I was navigating this, and fortunately, I had Kara, my, you know, career coach, who also um, certified me as a master career coach um, by my side. And, and, you know, I was in tears, I was frustrated, I was like, I want to get them, I want to get a lawyer, you know, all of these things. And then she said, Nada, just think about like, how is that, how is this going to help you? Right. How is unleashing, you know, all of your anger going to help you? Right. And, and it's truly right. As someone who was a VP of HR, she said to me, like, who is who is paying them? Right. It's the organization. They work for the organization. So why would they put themselves in a liability situation? Right. That's something that you want to think about. So at the end of the day, my advice is. Same thing, like, you're, and I'll, I'm not going to steal the funeral analogy. That was awesome, by the way. I'm just going to compare it to a relationship when you're going through a breakup. Is it really necessary to just, you know, point out all the person's flaws and, and put them down and let them know why you're leaving or just be thankful about the parts that helped you? Here's the thing. Even if it was terrible, I'm sure that it created a lot of growth for you and you learned from that situation. So I would highlight the positive aspects because it is a small world. I am not joking with you that it is a small world. That company, 
I'm not going to say what the name of that company that I left because of the horrible situation. I had someone come to me from that company as a client. So imagine if I spread all of this stuff about how terrible they were um, and, you know, fast forward to today, right? How that would look like. So um, I would keep it a very, very succinct letter and just simply say, thank you so much. And that's how I coach my client who also left the toxic situation. Thank you so much for everything that you've done for me. I have learned a lot. And um, here is my formal resignation. Um, you know, if you want to give them two weeks notice or whatever, you know, you want to give them, um, I will be starting, you know, my new role in date X. And that's it. Keep it short and sweet. That's how you write the letter. Super. Well, thank you so much, Nada and Chris for responding. Hey, we're having so much fun here, guys. Keep the questions coming. Uh, we'll love to hear from you. Uh, we'll keep it going. Uh, I'm going to stick with you here, Nada. Nada, uh, my next question is for you um, and questions around mentorship. Does one really need a mentor to thrive in their, in their path or journey towards career success? And if they do, how and where can one get mentors suitable for or, or get the most suitable mentor? Yeah, um, great, great question. Um, and I think, well, first of all, I think everyone should have a mentor. Everyone really should have a mentor. I don't think I'd be where I am today if I didn't have a guide, if I didn't have a mentor that I can speak to, someone who um, either went through what I went through, someone um, whose footsteps that I want to follow, someone that I look up to. Um, that could be in the form of a boss. You know, if you have a boss who's a mentor, you're absolutely lucky. Um, and I've had that privilege as well. Um, it could be in the form of, you know, someone you connect to that you really admire and ends up, you know, taking you under their wing, which I've seen a lot. Um, and so there are different types of mentors. Now, I want to highlight the difference between a mentor and a coach, because there is a very distinct difference. And the difference between a mentor and a coach, and a mentor could be both, a mentor could also be a coach, but the distinct difference is a mentor will generally um, teach you based on their own experience, right? Which is fabulous, fabulous, because that's how strong connections and bonds get created. It's a wonderful thing. Um, it is a wonderful thing to have a relationship with, with someone who, whose example you want to follow, a role model. Now, the thing that you want to be careful of, it is kind of like sometimes where, um, you know, because it is based on a single person's point of view at times, while the goal may be great, um, the approach may not always work for you, right? And so it's kind of like um, you talk to someone who went through the same illness that you went through and you say, well, what kind of medication did you take? And maybe that medication is not going to work for, for you. And so this is why it's valuable to work with a coach um, who will work with you to find an approach that is specific to you as an individual, right? And generally speaking, a coach will use empiricism, a good coach will use empiricism and data that's out there in the market, because they have tested, you know, um, on hundreds of clients, you know, what is the common denominator for each specific situation, different personalities, different archetypes, what works for, you know, each case. And so that is the difference. And a coach will never tell you what to do. You have got to be careful of that when you work. If you work with a coach who tells you, I think you should do this or, or this should be your goal, that is definitely dangerous because a coach should help you come up with your own decision. In that situation that I was um, talking to you all about with my client who was going through a toxic situation, I never said to her, you should leave or stay. I said, these are the pros and cons of what would happen if you leave. These are the pros and cons of what would happen if you stay. What do you think are the pros and cons that, would, that you're able to work with? Um, how do you find um, a mentor? Um, there are different ways, right? You could 
um, uh, find a mentor through an event, find a mentor through work, through an association, you could reach out to them. There are multiple ways. Um, how do you find a professional coach or how do you choose a professional coach? Um, there are a few things that you want to look at when you choose a professional coach. First thing you want to do is you want to look for someone who's part of an association. And I'll tell you why. You see, um, unfortunately, the coaching world is a little bit um, not very regulated, right? And you have to be careful um, because everyone can call themselves a coach. And I'll tell you firsthand that I've been a victim of that multiple times where I spent a lot of money and um, in a way, I either I didn't get the, the best results or the approach that was given to me was in a way a little bit toxic. OK, um, and I'm not I'm not going to talk and, and it's not career coaching, actually, it was actually within health. You know, I worked with uh, different um, health coaches and they gave me advice that that actually created a negative impact on my health. Um, and so you want to find um, a career coach who is part of an accredited or professional association because they are upheld by a code of conduct and they are audited. Like I, for example, am audited because I'm part of the International Association of Career Coaches. Um, you know, Kara sometimes looks over my cases to make sure that whatever advice I'm giving is the right advice. And also when you are part of an association, we tend to share our cases and get um, advice on them. Um, the other thing that you want to look for as well is testimonials, right? Um, Every person has a different situation. And when you watch the testimonials, not only do you get reassured that this person has a high success rate, but also maybe there is someone that you identify with who, ha who, is, who has gone through what you went through. And that is a great way to pick a coach based on your need and based on the results that you want to get. Um, what else? The third thing that you want to look for is that has this coach helped a reasonable number of people? Um, because let's face it, um, it's kind of like a doctor who has done the surgery multiple times and has enough data and facts to guide you in the best way possible. Because sometimes this may work, a resume may work for one employer, uh, one employer may prefer it being that way, um, but then the 70% may not prefer it being written that way. Um, then the last thing I wanted to say is you want to ask yourself these questions when you pick a coach is how big do you want your transformation to be, right? Um, how fast do you want to be? Because to get to your destination, there could be different ways. You could go the roundabout way, right, where it could take you years. Um, let's say you wanted to go to the Cancun, you know, you could take the bus. <laughs> I don't know, actually, it may take you forever if you took the bus. <laughs> or you, you could, you know, take a plane, right? Or you could take a train, right? And so ask yourself, what is my tolerance? Do I want to experiment? Or do I want a um, basically proven approach that helps me get there? And of course, how much support do you need? Um, my client, for example, you know, Rashid, who landed at Amazon, um, or I have clients like my client Heath, who ended up at Miniclip, one of the, you know, top gaming companies. Um, he was pulling his hair for months trying to figure it out. But when we worked together, it was a matter of months, you know, a few months and he landed up, landed in, in the career of his dreams. So that's just a general guideline. And of course, um, find someone that you get along with too, because it's important. No one ever wants to be treated by a doctor who scares the crap out of them. I know that I would, you know, hesitate to, to get the treatment if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, well, thanks so much, Nada. Well, I mean, Nada, I think you're bringing so much fun into this round table. We're having so much fun. I can see Chris is having so much fun over there as well. Um, this is really exciting. And I think some really, really import important points you made. Uh, know the difference between your mentor and your coach. Now, I, and I say this to people, mentorship is key, but mentorship is a two-way street. Uh, but keep in mind, even though you have your mentors, Watch what your mentors do. Don't follow everything your mentors do. Your mentors may have bad habits. Don't follow those bad habits. You know, uh, so keep in mind, 
And when you talk about coaches, coaches are more strategic, they're more tactical in their approach to looking at every solution and tailoring every solution to that individual's need. Uh, the last piece I'm going to add is an extra one in. We and we talked about this previously at the roundtable. Is know the difference between a, a, your mentor and your sponsor. They're two different people. Mentors will mentor you to get into a position. Sponsors will help you get ahead. But don't go to your sponsor asking for how to get it done. Talk to your coach. <laughs> and uh, we're going to keep going. Thank you so much, Nada. This is exciting. We're going to keep going. Uh, next question is for Chris. Chris, our uh, question to you is about networking. Uh, what is the impact of social networking on one's career growth? And how can, how can, how can one realistically build their social net, network for career growth? Over to you, Chris. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and by the way, now that I was taking notes. Um, but what I want to say, uh, social network uh, is, is now described as, uh, you know, the social part and professional. And we, we need to be, uh, again, being intentional to figure where we are with that. Um, so I'll take it from the point of view of seeing a professional network. If you're uh, the or any network really, the impact that it has or the potential it has is to expand your horizons, to give you that different perspective, to let you meet other voices, uh, to let you see emerging thoughts and ideas in your field or in fields that you are of interest in if you're thinking of transitioning. So that is the potential that networks have. Uh, usually when you're talking about how can one build it or realistically grow it, uh, sometimes we, we'd have to understand the underlying objective of the network that we're in. If you're joining, say, for instance, a church group or a hockey group or a movie group, then career group will be a byproduct of that. It's not going to be the main objective. So if I'm coming to, you know, you join a tennis club, I'm here to play tennis, not necessarily to sit with you and tell you, you know, how to navigate your path. As we become better tennis players and that relationship builds, then it can transition into, hey, this opportunity exists or this is what I'm doing in my area. This is how I'm, I'm dealing with these other challenges beyond the social sphere. Um, likewise, if you're going into a professional group, which you're socializing and that's a part of your social network, then that's a little bit more streamlined. But again, here you'd have to first realize what the objective is, what it is you want to take from these groups and how do you build them? Uh, again, it's, it's reading about them. It's using the internet to find. It's a bit of trial and error because uh, picking up on what Nada says, you can go to a group and it, it really is terrible for you. And some, you know, and, and it goes there and he finds it wonderful. So you have to be willing to dabble and try ones. It's like, um, uh, and not being sexist, but it's like uh, women who go in and try different dresses. You can't just pick one. I know men, you know, tell me just pick one, but you know, if you ever go and watch, you know, the female shop, they will they'll try one. And even if it fits, they try another and another. And the idea is that you're trying to get best fit, you know, and one outfit goes for one event and another outfit goes for another event. So you'd want to be able to look at the social networks, look at what their objective is, see if it aligns with the purpose that you have. And so, and then you can actually then straddle on your career uh, uh, ambition to that. Uh, but always remember that it, you have to, uh, there's a thing, what's in it for me? When you go to an objective, when you come to even this forum, what is in it for me? And you have to be clear about what you want to get out of that. And then again, you plan and execute on that. Okay, super. Thanks so much, uh, Chris. And, and I find it very interesting, especially in today's, um, social networking world, um, there was COVID and networking had to be more virtual. Um, I find myself to be someone that um, I thrive better in an environment where uh, it's physical and I had to relearn how to social network on LinkedIn, um, you know, reaching out to people like Nada on LinkedIn, um, how we connected 
and then we did a virtual coffee. Um, so there are different ways, different strategies that people have to employ. But I think the most important thing, just like you said, is being intentional around the networking. Uh, and thankfully, um, things are opening up now. People can go out and network and social network uh, really good. And I think the impact of networking is having people that you can partner with, is having people that can be of uh, support to whatever it is that you're trying to achieve from a career perspective. Uh, do you want to say something, Chris? Absolutely. And uh, one of the things, as you picked up on COVID, and, and being able to go virtual, we we are we have not. We're, I can't say we have learned because we have. It's been two years that there are some spaces that virtual is nice. There are some per, and then there are some ones that you'd want to meet in person. And I know some persons are introverted, and it's sort of like, okay, how do I go and talk to somebody? And you know, but uh, so what you can do is use the the the, the, the hybrid approach. I'd say there are certain networks that you want to do the virtual approach to. And then you cannot, and if you want to migrate that, then it can also be the physical. So it's it's not an either or, and I'm not saying that you're saying that, but you can understand now that you have a plethora of ways in which you can actually do this. It doesn't mean that every time you need to think of networking, you got to think, okay, fine, I got to get dressed, I got to figure out my hair, I got to do this, I got to make sure, and you worry about the 20 other things. It can also be from your living room you can be a bit more relaxed. And as you build that confidence and the interest, because it's not just their interest in you, it's your interest in them as well. If you find more interested, then it might be worth, you know, the additional effort now to go in person. And so that's one way in which you can actually look to explore networks. Uh, try virtual first. Yeah, super, super. Thanks so much, Chris. This is exciting. Uh, Nada, uh, I do have one question for you, but then there's another question in the chat that I'd like to address to you, pass back to you uh, before we go into the, you know what, I'm just going to read out this question and then we'll go into the uh, uh, the final question for the for this round table, uh, that which one's for you, uh, Nada. Uh, this one here, what are some good approaches when you are asking someone to become a mentor or coach. Uh, so that, that one I'll let you take, but I will, before you go into that, I wanna, I, I wanna be able to ask the last question. Uh, sometimes, and this one is around, you know, feeling stagnant. Sometimes people get uh, to those points where they feel like they're stagnant or just lack the will to go out and uh, go out there and do more. Um, how best can one get fired up to gain to regain that strength? All right. So I'll answer, you know, this question first around being stagnant. Um, it all ties into that question that I, you know, um, mentioned is what is it costing you staying where you're at? Right. And I know that it is very hard as human beings for us to navigate a change. It's sometimes, you know, it's, it's just comfortable. It's just easier being where we're at. Um, I'll give you guys something that's not even career related. Um, it's actually um, related to health. And I know that um, my lifestyle was insanely active before the pandemic started. I was, um, you know, I, I do salsa. I, I um, exercise, I go for long bike rides, I was taking the subway on a daily basis to the financial district um, where I used to work. And going into pandemic was a shock to my system. It was an insane shock to my system. Um, that is literally when I started my business and I was always inside. I was on calls all day with clients um, and I put on an insane amount of weight. Um, and I started... You know, at first I started telling, oh, it's not this, it's not that bad. It's fine. I'm, I'll be okay. And, and um, I was working with a health coach too. And I said, you know what, it's, it's fine. I'm okay. You know, it's not like I'm, I'm overly overweight and that. And I just kept lying to myself. Right. Until one day I was walking, you know, with my partner and it's a joke because my partner used to not be able to keep up with me. This is the person who would dance salsa for four hours in one night. And him and I were walking and I was like, oh my God, I'm out of breath. And I was like, oh my God, what is wrong with me? Am I having a stroke? This is insane. 
I was literally terrified for myself. And I found out that I was borderline diabetic. That's what happened to me. And that was my wake up call. And I remember um, messaging, you know, a health coach that I was following. Um, she's a food scientist. And this is where you have to check people's credentials, right? And um, I worked with her. I, I messaged her and I said, this is what's going on. She went on my website. She's like, okay, if you're serious, we're going to get on a call today. I was like, wow. And, and I'm like, oh, my God, is this really her? Because she's like a celebrity. And she sent me a voice note. That's how I knew it was really her. So we got on a call and um, she said, I can help you. And I heard that many times. But somehow when she said that to me, I knew that she could help me. Um, maybe I worked with three coaches before her and they all gave up on me. <laughs> And then when I worked with her, literally within two weeks, all of a sudden I lost weight, um, you know, in a span of two months, 18 pounds gone. Um, and you know what? Sometimes it's a combination of, yes, we, you have to have, I call it the three M's. You have to have the right mindset in terms of you want to do it, but it's not enough to want to do it because if you're given the wrong method, and that's the second M, then it can actually make you give up because I had given up on myself mainly because I felt that I tried a whole bunch of things and none of them were working. But then when I took that leap of faith and tried a different method, all of a sudden, you know, I have more energy. I can do everything I want to do. I'm able to, I'm, I'm on a, the right composition of food that's right for my body. And this is why I tell people um, it's important to not just have the desire and the motivation, but you need three things. You need the mindset. Um, and that's the, when you ask yourself what's costing you and the why. You need to have the motivation. Obviously, with everything in life, with every change, you need to dedicate time to do it. And believe me when I say I have single moms and fathers who juggle multiple things and are still able to, you know, achieve amazing things with their career when they go through my program. And then the third thing is the method. You need to have the right method. Don't let a coach or someone um, make you feel bad because they're giving you the wrong method and you're trying your best and you're not getting results. That was like the big epiphany for me is I was blaming myself and I realized I just wasn't given the right method. So my advice is the three M's, mindset, motivation, method, find someone who will align to your personality and a process that will resonate with you in order to achieve your goals. And that will make the change easier to navigate. Mindset, motivation, method. Uh, thank you so much, Nada. Nada, do you care to respond to the second part of the question, though? How do you find a coach or mentor? Yeah, so how you find a coach is um, alluding to, you know, what I mentioned around, um, there are several ways, you know, like look for associations. For example, there's the International Association of um, Career Coaches. You know, I'm one of the members there. Um, look at look for recommendations as well. Ask your friends, you know, a lot of my clients who come to me are through referrals. And generally speaking, when you're friends with people, you share the same values. So it is possible that, um, you know, if um, they worked with a coach who's in alignment with their values and you're friends with, pers with that person, you may have similar values. Um, those are my two big things. And, you know, sometimes, um, and this is how I found my health coach, <laughs> social media is amazing. And if you're watching a person's content for a while and you're like, wow, this is actually really good stuff and it's resonating with you, then that is definitely a good sign that um, this is someone that, that may be able to help you. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Nada. Thank you, thank you. Again, lots to unpack there, Nada. Uh, mindset, motivation, method. Uh, if you feel stagnant in your job, in your career, uh, you know, there needs to be a shift in mindset. You need to uh, find something to motivate you and then come up with a method, come up with a strategy, something that will get you, uh, you know, start asking the why, what do I really want? And, uh, you know, and the rest, um, 
you know, will fall into place. Thank you so much, Nada. Uh, we'll, we'll go to you, uh, Chris. Chris, uh, this question is quite interesting. I find it really interesting because a lot of people find themselves in different uh, work environments. Some people find themselves in a startup environment and others find themselves in a big corporate environment. Now, question to you, what effects does being in a, being a big fish in a small pond or the other side, or being a small fish in a big pond have on one's career growth or progression? Uh, which one is preferred for a startup? Um, you're, you're not making it easy for me for the last one, but um, uh, here's my bite at that. Uh, uh, and I'll start with the last question first. Which one is preferable? I think that is dependent on the, your personality, your career goals, your life event. Uh, because speaking of a big fish in a small pond, this is where you, you know, you have great influence within an organization, a group, or a geographical area. So you know, you, everyone knows your name. It's all sort of like celebrity uh, sort of thing. Um, and then being a small fish in a big pond is where you don't have that much influence or power in that large group. You can thrive in both, but it's dependent on. Um, but some of it is circumstances. Um, I'm from Jamaica, and then I moved to the New York. So I was in a small. I was a small fish in a small pond, and so it was a lot less exercise to swim in that pond. And someone, and then all of a sudden, I'm now a small fish in an even bigger pond. And so it's dependent on uh, if you are passionate about what you do um, and you're dedicated and to that passion, the success will come. Um, the success will come. If you, if you, you just a matter of like um, applying what Nada said, the method, the mindset, the motivation, um, it will come. Uh, it will come faster for others than 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 yourself. But and and so uh, I'd I'd want to leave with say don't start comparing necessarily your journey to someone else. If you have your own goal and you're succeeding at that goal, then that's okay. So what I'd say is that the, the whether or not you're the small fish or the big fish, uh, your personality will tease that out. And if you're not liking the celebrity would of being you know that power and influential person, then maybe you know, having less of a limelight on you would work for you. If you do gravitate and thrive when the light is on you, if you are your best when the lights are bright and the audience is at your attention, then that is your niche. And so you, it's understanding which one you are. It's not either or, both can work. And as you transition and grow your career, you could be like, okay, I've had enough of the limelight, or you could be like, this is my moment. So uh, it's, I know it's a bit of a nuance, um, like I'm dancing around the topic a bit, but all it, be, it depends on you. What it comes down to is know what your goal is, what your intention is, what your belief is, and you execute on that and let your own journey, your destination, your ambition drives you. Yes, you can look in the next lane, but don't focus on that lane so much that you're not looking where you're driving because that's what matters. So compare, yes, look across, but don't let be the, be the focus and the tagline of where you're going. Hmm. Wow, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That's really uh, inspiring. Um, and I think for me, I believe, I agree 100%. Uh, whatever situation you find yourself, make the best out of it. Uh, if you find yourself in a small environment, do your best as though you're in a big environment. Be the best version of yourself, whatever the situation is, um, and um, you know the result will follow. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we're about wrapping up. Uh, as, we, as we wind down, uh, we would like to hear some takeaways. We'd like to hear what the panelists want to share with us in terms of biggest, the biggest takeaways on this call, or just a general takeaway. I'm going to stick with you here, Chris. Chris, uh, what are some of the takeaways if you're looking at as we're wrapping up the call? Uh, you know, what, what are some of the key takeaways you want the audience to leave, leave with tonight? Oh, today. Um, so, so, so my takeaways are going to be um, uh, stolen quotes from other people, not included. Um, and I'll end with yours, Nada. What I'd want to say first is that um, in your career group, we're sometimes tempted to judge ourselves by 
what others is doing and where others are going. Um, as immigrants, sometimes we look back and like, okay, my friends back home, they're now at this position and I'm here and I'm not making it. And, uh, and, you, and you get bogged down by that. And the quote that I'd want to leave you there is that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will always fail. You know, it will always fail. So what, I, what, I, what that means for your personal situation is that um, you're here, this is now, this is the present, this is what you can affect, make the best use of this. There's no other you, you're unique in that way, so execute on that. And yes, you can have ambition and drive. Uh, if you're not where you want to be, then that just tells you that you've got some work to do, be that you wanna get a coach, be the mentor, um, seek out um, allyship for sponsorship, but there are ways and means to do that. And so we left with um, the mindset, the motivation and the method. And that's all Nardas that you hear today that I'm repeating for you because it resonated with me. Um, get in the mindset if you don't want, if you're, not, if you're not sure of where you want to be or if you're not where you want to. Be motivated enough to try at it and to be determined and to persevere and choose the right method. And that's what I'd leave with you. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. We really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us and sharing, uh, you know, very, very important nuggets here. Really, really thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, we're going to go to you, Nada, as we're wrapping, as we're wrapping up. Uh, Nada, on your hand, what are some of the key takeaways you want the audience to leave with tonight? And I keep saying tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the key takeaway is that, um, you know, people break records all the time, right? Um, I have a, you know, and, and also, um, we have a big joke in my community of over 100 people, where we say that the turtle wins the race. It's a big, you know, going joke. And it started with my client, Rashid, who took um, 12 months to basically um, end up landing his big goal um, of not only figuring out his immigration, you know, process of coming to Canada, but also to land at a company like Amazon when he never had the title of product manager and actually, um, and you'll all be surprised to hear this, and this is the whole, you know, you know, big fish or small fish kind of analogy is that, you know, after a decade in his career, he actually never worked for a single employer. He had his own company um, and um, in Mexico. And then he went from that in a tiny little small startup to landing at Amazon. And people will say, well, can you, can, what if I waste my whole career, you know, working for a startup or doing this or doing that? Well, look at Rashid, you know, um, he landed at Amazon, his first ever employer as a senior product manager. Um, so um, the big thing that I think people um, uh, deal with is impatience. That is probably the biggest um, obstacle that most people face when it comes to achieving goals is they're very impatient. They want quick wins. And because of that, um, they end up missing out. Um, and Rashid is my perfect, you know, example of um, this is the big goal that I want to go for, and I'm not going to settle and I'm going to be laser focused and achieve it. When he came to me, he said, I don't want to, I don't want to work for any employer other than, you know, someone in the U S or Canada and it has to be a big company. And I'm like, Oh my God. But because of that, because of his patience, he achieved his goal. And I use him as an example in my cohort to the point that my other client, um, her name is Sonia. Um, she ended up also increasing her salary by 256% and going right into a senior um, UX role when she's never had the title and it's her first you know, design role and only did a boot camp. So um, the turtle wins the race. Um, you, you don't worry about whether someone has done it before because you can always break records. Have a growth mindset. Don't tell yourself, what if I don't find this person who's gonna help me? What if I don't do this? What if I get fired? Remove the what if and tell yourself that you can and you will be able to achieve it through the right mindset, motivation and method. Okay. All right. Sweet. Uh, thank you so much. 
Nada, this is amazing. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and for sharing uh, these very, very important lessons and nuggets. Uh, thank you, Chris. We're really appreciative of your contribution. Uh, as we're about to wind down uh, this round table, I just want to acknowledge uh, a few uh, questions in the chat. I know uh, there's been since we uh, last addressed the questions in the chat. I do want to recognize that uh, uh, folks that are looking for mentors, there's so many ways to get mentors. You can network with people, reach out to people on LinkedIn, people within your social network, approach them. Um, you know, it's easy to approach people. Just say you want to be, you like to learn from them. And, you know, again, if you reach out to 10, 20 people, you find two people that will be interested in uh, being your mentor, being your, being, uh, being your mentor. Uh, and the other ways that we recommend, and we've shared this in the past at this forum, is read books. Now, authors are the easiest mentors to find. And they're the most unbiased mentors because you're learning from them and you don't get to learn some of the things we talked about earlier that may not necessarily align with your goals. Uh, read books. I read books a lot. I find a lot of my mentors by reading books. Uh, so uh, we do recommend that you do that. Uh, but in terms of takeaways, I'm uh, really excited. Today's session has been really, really uh, impactful. Uh, I've, we've learned a lot. Uh, you know, you, you need to start with what kind of impact you're trying to create. Uh, we've learned that uh, it's important to diversify your access to information, different ways, read books, podcasts, um, you know, uh, diversify who you're listening to. Uh, we talked about, we've talked about storytelling. Storytelling, you know, when you go for interviews, when you're sitting in front of hiring managers, storytelling is key. It, it makes it more personable. It makes your uh, connection to them more, uh, well, more organic. So storytelling, and you have to be very strategic when you tell your story. Tell your story based upon what you're trying to, what position you're going for. I know Nada talked about uh, the storytelling from a standpoint of, people have storytelling from a standpoint of a, a data analyst or, or business analyst. If you're going for a project manager role, do your storytelling as a project manager. We talk about mentorship. Uh, you know, how do you access mentors, coaches, or even sponsors? Know the difference. Um, uh, intentional, being intentional with your networking, uh, again, there's a lot to take away. The turtle wins the race. And, and like uh, one of our previous panelists shared, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So uh, thank you so much, everybody. On behalf of the entire OLE consulting team, we'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us today. We also want to give a, give a big shout out to the participants on the call today for joining, for joining us for today's round table. We really appreciate it. We, we're not taking it for granted. We we'll appreciate you for joining us today. Uh, OLE Consulting, you can reach us uh, on social media, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, we'd like to hear from you. Or if you want to uh, learn more about what we do, uh, again, we're a management consulting firm specialized in IT professional services, uh, connecting IT professionals to opportunities within the industry. We also provide training, mentorship, and employment placement services for individuals that are looking to get into the field of project management and business analysis. Again, thank you once again to all the panelists. Uh, and uh, we, we wish you well. Uh, be well, stay safe, and bye for now. Thanks, everyone.